Welcome to the True Health Tuesdays question and responses for herniated disc. Let's get into this. Okay, question one from Eric's 9461. What are the best exercises for keeping herniated discs at bay and healing? Also, what other exercises can restore the lordotic curve? Okay, another person commented, um, would have been nice to have some recommended exercises and other te- techniques we'd use at home. I'm absolutely with you. That's why we have, oh, a few thousand videos. <laughs> a lot. Look at our pelvic health video. That's going to be one of the best ones, particularly in herniated discs for the lumbar. But when you're looking at this, the spine gets its strengths from the curves. That means that the curves of the spine are essential in the strength. Now, the muscles that run down either side of the spine, they're not under conscious control. So you don't want to strengthen the muscles because they're, they're really going to respond to proprioception. Think of like a cat. You know, a Halloween cat goes like that when they're scared and the muscles fire off. So look at restoring the curves and then look at stabilizing and correcting the area above and below where you've been told you had a herniated disc. Because you're never going to see a disc injury on the bottom, okay, in the lumbar area without having some abnormal force loading on the top. So if there's been an old thoracic injury or cervical injury or knee injury or foot injury or hip injury causing the gait to be altered or causing that force loading to be altered, that's going to be the source of that herniated disc, not just some, you know, lifting um, a child or lifting a trash can. Restoring the natural curves and looking at the altered biomechanics from past injuries. So restoring foot biomechanics, knee biomechanics, stabilizing the pelvis, and looking at the entire spine. Don't be confused by symptoms. 90% of the nerves coming off that spine, there's no pain fibers. So don't let the symptoms guide your care. Question two from Robert Cole, 7297. I carried too heavy a load, injured my low back, and I walk like a zombie. (laughs) Um, brother, it wasn't carrying too heavy a load, and I'll go over that. Uh, another person asked, uh, from Mark B, uh, same with my wife. Her disc snapped, uh, three months ago, painful to sit, sleep. Last week, she had a cortisone shot, and it's helping the pain. Look at pain as the alarm and never, ever, ever the problem. So you're not going to remove the battery out of the fire alarm because it's ringing, and it's not lifting. So many times patients have been told that, well, you're, oh, you bent wrong or turn or you shouldn't lift where you're turning. None of that makes sense. What happens is you've lifted the same type of heavy load before, more than likely, you know, maybe years ago or days ago, but it's, you're doing a normal action and having an abnormal response. Now, when you're having trouble sitting, sleeping, everything, That lumbar is right on top of the sacrum, and that sacrum houses the resting, digesting, and repairing system. So this means that you're going to be in a sympathetic dominant state or a fight-or-flight state. Now, not being able to sit also means that there's going to be pelvic instability. So what you've got to do right now is look at uh, stabilizing the pelvis, but looking at why that's not functioning correctly. And if you look at our pelvic health video, you're going to see a trochanter support, very, very cheap. It's under 10 bucks. Stabilizing the pelvis will help really, really good. If you don't have that, uh, get a belt or something to bring, approximate those um, iliac crests together to de-stress that out. Um, look at the worst thing that you could do is to lay in your back. So what do to lay in your back with your legs bent. And a lot of physical therapists and doctors will meaning, but they don't know that when you're laying on your back with your legs bent, you're literally reversing the discs in the low back. So look at those therapies as absolutely negative. Look at restoring the natural curves as essential. But beyond that, looking at the abnormal force loading. So even though pain here, hurt here, cortisone shot here, that is so low-level thinking. Discs are 80 interconnecting rings of ligamentous tissue. One side, the other side, the other side. They're incredibly strong. So discs do not herniate under an acute force loading. They need to have long-term damage before because discs are tough. So that means that you've had 
some alteration in force loading. That means there's going to be a thoracic, cervical, or altered biomechanics of the lower extremities causing that disc to get compressed because discs have a horrible blood supply and they need movement. And that means when we do the adjustments, we're changing the position, movement, and communication of that vertebrae to the central nervous system or proprioception. And so you have to look at the entire structure to figure out why the disc got herniated and what the problem is. Very low level thinking. This is it. Hurt here, pain here, shoot here. Okay, discs will not herniate under a normal force loading. Discs that are damaged and with 90% of the nerves coming off the spine having no pain fibers, that means this damage could occur days, weeks, months, or years before, and then doing a normal activity getting that symptom. So you have to do a complete thorough assessment of the cervical spine, thoracic, lumbar, and the biomechanics down below. Then you're going to find the source of it. But any doctor that's shooting cortisone um, it just to reduce the pain, that is, that, that's a dangerous doctor. Question three from Charlie Whispers um, Pick Q. Um, hello, Dr. Bergman. Are inversion tables a good thing to use? I was wondering if it could um, be helpful for hip, sacrum, and lower back to regenerate another person. Um, uh, if an inversion table is not safe, is there in our market an upright hanging table that exists to give the hips, sacrum, low back ability to stretch through hanging the right side, um, uh, hanging right side up instead of inversion? Uh, the, the neat thing there is, what um, inversion, I say, is fantastic for humans, but for the general Americans, it's dangerous. And the reason is, when you're hanging upside down, fantastic for lymph flow. It's literally um, de-stressing out some of the vertebrae, so, so it's excellent. This is why when you're talking about the vertical or upright, yeah, just get a chair with arms, push down on the arms, and you're tractioning yourself. So that's a good de-stressor in the vertical upright position. Uh, but inversion tables are fantastic for humans, and I say dangerous for Americans, because when you're inverting, you're increasing the pressure in the blood in the brain, in a lot of different areas that aren't used to having that. And if your blood is unhealthy and toxic and thick, and you've had certain um, interventions like um, that we can't talk about on here, that can actually cause a clumping together of the red blood cells, or if you're taking medications, and you got to figure America, 5% of the world's population consumes 95% of the drugs, there's a good hunk of you that are drugged. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, you know, so you're looking at toxic, thick blood inverting. That is not safe. I donated my time when I was in chiropractic college um, at this office that had amazing techniques. And he had inversion tables on a lot of people. And I had to ask if they weren't doing any medications. And this one guy got up and said, yeah, you know, I feel a little weird after that. And, and you could tell that there was, you know, a rapid blinking of his eye, that there was something going on. And I said, wait a second, you said you were taking no medication, had healthy diets. And he says, well, yeah, no medication, but the aspirin a day for a healthy heart. Okay. Okay, good. You're taking something that weakens blood vessels and the doctor I'm working for just inverted your head <laughs> because he was unaware of that. So it, it used extreme caution but it is fantastically good if you have healthy blood and healthy tissue production. Because when you're in a chronic state of stress, you've got two switches on your body. One can keep you alive under stress, and that's the sympathetic. But if you're in a chronic state of stress, your tissue production is low. That means the health of your tissue is not good. If you're in a regenerative state or the parasympathetic state, and you have the system balanced, then you have healthy tissue Good diet, good exercise, good sleep, good blood, beautiful. It's fantastic for you. But if you have chronic states of stress and the blood becomes thick under any kind of physical, chemical, emotional stress, I do not recommend it. But if not, man, get a chair with arms, push down on it, and you're de-stressing out that, those discs. Question four from user NF5FO6GX9G. Odd name. Hello, doctor. Thank you for this great opportunity. And my name is Miriam. I'm 35 years old. 
from Mauritania. I got this injury um, back in 2019, and my lumbar spine uh, once checked the same day. I've been told it's a herniated disc. <laughs> it happened when I was bending to pull a heavy water bottle. I had no idea but a lot of pain and fear. Um, I got so much in so much informed about it through your YouTube channel. Thank you. God bless you, dear. Um, I've been told to do a surgery, but I didn't want. I went through some chiropractic treatments in vain. I still live in pain every day. Since then, I've been listening to my body and avoiding lifting uh, anything heavy, avoiding exercises like squats, among others. Is there any chance to get it absorbed, as I have been told? Absolutely. You got to figure herniated discs are living tissue. Any tissue that is damaged, such as there's a sequestration of that disc, like a part of the tissue is broken off, then you have macrophages that chew up abnormally placed tissue. So that you can get, you just, just know that the, it's so low level thinking to think pain here, MRI there, herniated disc there, and it's from lifting a water bottle. That is not possible because you were doing a normal activity with an abnormal spine and with 90% of the nerves that come off of the spine having no pain fibers. Just think of this, you know, you're fine, everything, you reach in the back of your bag, oh, and your back goes out. You're doing a normal activity with an abnormal structure. So you have to look at what the problem is. And this is not going to be that action of lifting the water bottle. It's going to be why um, was that disc damage? So you have to look at the force loading. So look way beyond the pain. Okay, so have somebody look, and this is where the chiropractors uh, also get sucked into um, the world of insanity where hurt here, pain here, look there without looking at the entire structure. Because if your head is laterally deviated, that is going to put an abnormal force landing on the lumbar. If your thoracic is a compensatory lateral deviation or there's some kind of altered force loading, that's one of the contributing factors to the disc. So find what caused the problem. It is never going to be lifting a, a, a heavy load herniating a disc because you've lifted those loads before. It's going to be doing that action with an abnormal shaped disc. And then you've got to find out why that disc, because discs get their nutrients through movement. And if you have inappropriate force loading, normal movement is going to cause damage. So look at the entire structure. And I'm with you on chiropractic treatments. They should have a flexion distraction table so you can open up the joints if they're just massaging muscles or ultrasounding muscles without understanding why the muscles are firing off. And you've got to understand that because the muscles that run down either side of the spine, okay, they are not under conscious control. And so those muscles typically are going to be firing off because there's, there's some type of nerve pressure or sensory input into the brain, and then the brain sends a motor impulse down to tighten up that. <laughs> so, so you got to look at why that disc herniated, not pain here. And this is where, um, just like all doctors, doctor chiropractic, if they're um, focused in on the pain, they may be missing the source of the problem. If you focus in on why did this happen, that's critical thinking. Um, then they're going to find the problem. So look at the entire spine. And their discs are alive. So you change the force loading, change the position, then the disc can regenerate. They're living tissue. And <laughs> Question five from Passi. One, two, three, five, six, seven. I have biconcave shaped vertebrae across all the lumbar spine, according to the MRI scans. This is supposed to be hereditary. <laughs> and is there... And there is visible bulging in multiple regions. Does the shape of my spine cause bulging uh, more easily if it happens? So what can I do about it? I'm still very young at 26. I don't want to live a life full of pain. Um, you do not have to live a life full of pain. When you're looking at, at biconcave, because the look at the vertebrae is, is supposed to be square in the lumbar. They're at a slight angle, okay, in the thoracic area. Uh, but that means the central portion of the verte vertebral body has been dented in. Now, this is very, very common um, when kids are lifting great weights before skeletal maturity. 
super, super common. Some of them are going to be called Schmerl's nodes. There's, there's a lot of distortion there. Could be nutrient deficiencies, everything else. But now, this is where a lot of doctors get um, uh, d distracted, okay? <laughs> I mean, they're not good detectives. Beautiful, biconcave discs. Are there people with biconcave vertebrae or vertebrae that have that don't have any back pain? Absolutely. So instead of looking at just that area and realize that MRIs, when they're done, you're generally laying down. That means gravity is pushing down, the table's pushing up, and they're only MRIing one area, the area of discomfort or of symptoms. And that doesn't show the force loading on that area. It doesn't show if the pelvis is unstable. So in people with, and don't worry about the, the vertebrae because you're always going to have those. They're always going to be there. And there's uh, millions and millions of people with that anomaly that have no issues whatsoever. So just because they're seeing an anomaly doesn't mean that it's a contributing factor. Now let's look at the problem. The pelvis is more than likely going to be unstable. Look at the biomechanics of the feet. If your big toes lean in towards the other ones, like if there's beginning bunion formation, that means that the nerves at the top of the sacrum have been compromised. So look at the also the entire structure. So a normal neck should have a curve. If your head's forward or laterally deviated, that's going to be a contributing factor to the low back. Uh, if the gait is altered, if there's hip issues. So look at the entire structure the MRI, the multiple bulging discs, the, the, all the other um, bells and whistles that they're telling you is the problem is not. It says that there is a problem in that area, but it doesn't answer why. And this is the low level of thinking, pain here, shoot here, surgery there. Because by looking at the entire stru structure, when you change the force loading and you restore the natural lordotic and kyphotic curves, then that disc can regenerate to a healthy configuration. Let me back that up again, okay? You fix the problem, the thing can regenerate healthy. It's, it's, it's like basic common sense. So find the problem, and the problem is not the herniated discs or the biconcave vertebrae. That is, was a pre-existing condition. Look at the altered biomechanics of gait, so feet, knees, hips. Look at pelvic instability. Look at the thoracic lateral deviation, um, hyper or hypokyphosis, look at forward head carriage, loss of curve. You address all of that force loading, then look at the chemical aspect, look at nutrition and sleep patterns, look at the emotional component. Okay, so when you're addressing the physical, chemical, and emotional uh, stressors, then your body has the best chance to regenerate. And you will get better, my friend. Question six from Cyber212. Uh, what corrective work do you provide the patient? Well, we do objective analysis first. We do digital posture analysis, static and stress digital x-rays, um, uh, thermography, uh, look at live blood cell analysis, three different nerve scans, a surface electromography, a rolling thermo scan, and uh, heart rate variability. So we do that as our general initial testing. We can also do at our at Tijuana clinic uh, a complete dental exam and a CBC or complete blood cell count. Now, well, that's the, the start, the objective analysis. Now, the corrective work, we're going to do post um, nerve scans and post blood analysis and post x-rays to document that we're fixing the problem. So the corrective work we're doing is we're doing structural and neurologic-based corrections. Now, how many times a day do you adjust the patient? Three to four times separated by 90 minutes. And in between that, because the body works on 90-minute cycles, we have them do cross-crawl exercises to change because the vertebrae is not out of place and we're not putting it in place. What we're doing, we're changing the position, motion, and communication. You have to change the sensory input from that vertebrae into the brain. And this changes the entire structure, changes the muscles on either side of the spine called the paravertebrals that don't have conscious control because it's not out and in place. You've got to change the entire structure 
So the lower ordotic curves, kythotic, um, you've got to restore that shock absor absorbing capability. Then you've got to change the biomechanics of the feet, the knees, and the hips. And so three to four times a day, depending on what the patient is. And since we do post x-rays and post nerve scans and blood analysis based on 30 adjustments, that could be, you know, two and a half weeks of care, we get post x-rays. How long on average is the patient expected to come in for uh, a consultation? Um, it really depends. Two, two weeks, we're pretty much going to be getting post x-rays, you know, on average. So that way we've got the initial set of scan and x-rays. Uh, then we have a second one to compare so we can see what's correcting and what's not. Because there could be lifestyle factors or compliance issues with doing some of the corrective exercises. And the exercises we prescribe are ligamentous-based exercises. They're not to see how strong you are. This is to restore the normal curve. So it's very, very basic, simple stuff. And in severe cases, people will stay for six weeks or two months. It really depends on the severity of the case and how much damage there is. Uh, so a lot of um, upper motor neuro lesion patients like, uh, uh, well, I, I can't really discuss that because this one, <laughs> I could do it on our private site. Um, but let's say they've had certain uh, interventions, medical interventions that are causing damage. And this, and we have to regenerate the neurons in the brain. It's called uh, neurogenesis, so uh, neuroplasticity. So this is why, um, based on the severity or what it is, like Parkinson's, MS, autism, you've got to heal the gut. That can take 30 days. You've got to change the sleep patterns. Okay, that, that can take a week. You can um, need to have them learn how to check their blood pressure because a lot of people are coming in heavily medicated. The average American over 60 has taken 12 prescriptions. And that, you cannot take 12 prescriptions and expect to recover. So I tell patients, look, don't take them all together. Separate them if you can by half hour or an hour. This way you're going to lessen some of the toxic effects. You know, this is just common sense stuff your grandma would tell you. So corrective work, you've got to do an objective analysis. How many times a day? Three to four. Uh, a buddy of mine up in Washington sees him nine times a day, but he has a different technique. And how long on average? Two and a half weeks. Uh, I mean, you can come in for two days, and that would give us the time to do all of the tests, the assessment, and you get one adjustment. And then you can plan on coming back. But man, Two and a half weeks, we're getting pre and post tested x rays. Okay, now if your question wasn't answered here, uh, go to the Dr. BVIP site because, and I, and I am able to respond more freely there based on the social media restrictions. Um, <laughs> there's certain things you can't say in this culture. God bless you all. Stay healthy, my friends.